All right. We're starting a new series today called Best Friends because I may need to clicker help today. Well, actually, I think I got it. One more. Because we're experiencing, you are experiencing right now in this very moment, a uniquely national and historic crisis of friendship. This is based on some national surveys. One out of 10 adults today say they have no close friends. That means one out of 10 of you would say you have no close friends. If your parents get a divorce, you don't know who to call. If you get a, a diagnosis of some sort, if someone close to you passes away, you have no one close to call. Um, some other numbers here, 60% of adults say they have a best friend, but in the 1990s, 75% of adults say they had a best friend. So the rate by which people are saying they have a best friend is going down continually. In fact, uh, most of the folks that I talk to today would say that they don't have a best friend, or maybe they don't even believe in a best friend. 36% of adults report feeling extended loneliness regardless of marital status. That's one of the myths that a lot of people who are younger, they think that once you get married, you know, you won't feel loneliness. The reality is some of the loneliest people in the world are those who not only are married, but have kids. Uh, and that's just part of life that, you know, it's hard to explain, but more relevant to yourself, 63% of young adults, that's all of you in this room, report suffering, anxiety, and depression uh, often linked to loneliness, that you can be around other people and yet feel a crippling sense of loneliness in your heart. I don't know, am I speaking to anyone in this room? Or maybe I should say it like this. If this is what's happening in the country, then my assumption in that is that it's at least happening to some of us in this room. And so I would wonder if loneliness, depression, anxiety, all wrapped up together is not just happening out there, but I wonder if it's happening right here. I wonder if it happens at night for some of you before you go to bed and you feel like another night going to bed without friends or someone close that I can call my friend. Now, according to the Bible, this is a travesty because the Bible begins, believe it or not, with friendship. This is the first book and the first three verses, four verses of the Bible. And Genesis 1 starts like this. In the beginning, God created. So there's a creator God. And then later on, it says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face. So there's God, the spirit. And then there's God said, let there be. so there's God, the word. And so in the beginning, in the first three, four verses of the Bible, you have God, the creator. God the Spirit and God the Word, and they are acting as, and they are three distinct persons, but they're one being living and existing intrinsically, existentially as a friendship. In other words, God himself is a friendship in his triune nature, and out of his triune nature, what does God do? He creates humanity. He creates people, and he creates people, says Genesis 1, 26 to 27, in his image. Let us make man in our image. I love that word, us, because it reflects the internal, eternal friendship of God within the Trinity. And out of that Trinitarian eternal friendship, God creates you and me to be like God. And therefore, you and I were created, much like God exists, to be in friendship, to have good, good friends, to perpetually and eternally experience really good friendship. And in fact, all throughout Genesis 1, as God creates all of existence, He's because he's God and he's a good God, and because the friendship that God is is so good, everything God creates is so good. And God says it. God creates this on the first day, and he said it was good. God creates that on the second day, and he said it was good. In all that creation story, there's only one instance where God says something is not good. And it's in Genesis 2, and it says this, and the Lord God said, it is not good 
This is God saying this, not you or me. So it's not preferential. This is divinely moral. It is morally not good that man should be alone. Therefore, because you were made in God's image, you were made for friendship eternally. And therefore, whoever is not experiencing friendship, even right now, you're experiencing something contrary to your human nature. It is inhumane to experience friendlessness. You understand? What, this is what the Bible is saying. It's not in your nature. It's not even animalistic. It is outside of your design to experience friendlessness. And I wonder, as a parenthetical point, maybe that's why loneliness is so devastating, isn't it? Why don't people get depressed and have anxiety over having too many good friends? Why is it always having no friends? Why is it that that causes the worst mental health problems? Because it's inhumane. It's outside of our nature. It's outside of our design. It's inhuman to be friendless. And I wonder if there is some inhumanity happening here in this room. I wonder if there's some inhumanity in some of your lives. Now, let's say you're not a Christian or you're a skeptic, okay? Even as a non-Christian, let me just, just level with me here. What is the common denominator in all of the worst decisions you've ever made in your entire life? You, <laughs> you are the common denominator. Your worst decisions you've ever made, those decisions that you regret forever, those times where you said, I hate that this is happening to me. I can't believe I decided to do this. You know, the common denominator is in all of those terrible decisions is you. And so even if you're not a Christian or you're not sure you're a Christian, you don't know if you buy into this whole, you were created by God to reflect him through friendship. Let's say you're not sure about that. Let me just level with you on this. Wouldn't you agree? Sometimes you make terrible decisions. And in fact, some of the worst decisions you make often are alone. Some of the most toxic, most self-deprecating, most, I would maybe I can use a trigger word, most pornographic decisions you make are often made alone. How many times have you ever thought, man, I, if I just had some other people to help me make this decision, I probably can make a better decision. So even if you're not a Christian, you should maybe agree, and maybe you do agree that having friends is something that's necessary. So having friends is a good, good thing. And some of you, if we're honest, I mean, maybe all of us, if we're honest, you know, I don't think we would deny that, even if you're not a Christian. I don't think you would deny that we need good friends. And maybe there's a part of you that really craves good friends. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, friendship is unnecessary. It's like philosophy, like art, like music, like the universe itself. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. I love that quote. Lewis is saying, you, you need food and oxygen and water to survive. You don't need friendships yet. But what point is there to survive if, if you don't have friends? And some of us feel like that, right? Some of you are just surviving. You're not thriving. Not because of an absence of a house and clothes on your back and food in your tummy, but because of an absence of friends. And so, uh, let me go back. And so, what we're going to start here in the next couple of weeks is a series on just that. On, a, on you and me, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, experiencing the fullness of our humanity by experiencing good friendships. But here's the thing, much like good marriages, good friendships don't just happen. It's just unfortunate reality. Some of us feel like, you know, we're just waiting around and we're kind of moping around in our loneliness. Here's what you got to hear, okay? That's incel mentality. The reality is good friendships, like good relationships, good marriages, good family, they, they don't just happen. They require, they require some wisdom and some work. I love this quote by Tim Keller, who talks, he's talking about the ultimate friendship, which the Bible calls marriage. He says, friendship is a deep oneness that develops, develops when two people speaking the truth and love to one another journey together to the same horizon. I love that's a beautiful image of friendship. He's saying friendships don't just land on your lap 
They don't just happen over just the course of time. They, are, they require intentionality. They require a developing and a journeying together. The Lord, the Frodo and his four friends, the three friends, they didn't just happen upon each other and just exist, coexist like trees in a forest, but they intentionally decided to commit to one another. That's why we call it a fellowship, the fellowship of the ring. And so to kick us off on this series today, we're going to talk about choosing biblical friendships, because some of us, as much as we know we need good friends, we're just, some of us are just waiting around for good friends to happen and exist and in and I'm telling you that that's illogical, right? If you want a great relationship with a, a beautiful young man or woman someday, you're not, you can't just sit there and do nothing, right? You have to do something to create that, to find that, to cultivate that. And that's the same with any friendship. All right. So let me start by sharing this um, book. This is a book by a youth pastor of a pretty large uh, youth group. In fact, I think it's the largest church still in America, Saddleback. The youth pastor there, he, he writes this book about friendships, and his argument is that there are three layers of friends. You have your casual friends, we can call them acquaintances, and there's a lot of people probably in that group, even classmates, people you sit next to, so-and-so who you know that person's name, you may not know much more than that, but you can maybe hold a conversation with that person. These people have very little influence over your life. Then we get to your Close friends. Close friends have a little more influence in your life. Um, over the course of time, close friends can either become the next closer intimate friend or they can fall out and become casual friends and it really doesn't infect, you know, impact your life very much. And so as I'm even explaining this, some of you can probably already imagine, you can already fill in some of these circles, right? Who are my casual friends? Oh, definitely so-and-so, so-and-so. And as we get a little closer, who are your close friends? I would consider so-and-so my closer. Yeah, yeah, these people don't have too much influence, but they do have some. And over the course of time, I can see us getting closer or further away from each other. And then this author would say, this pastor would say, then there are your core friends. And there are only few because your, your human heart doesn't, it's not infinite. There, you only have the capacity to have a few close friends. These are the friends that you would consider, man, they have high influence in my life. So if I'm going to make a decision on something like who to date, what to buy, how to dress, et cetera, et cetera, these are the friends that you're going to invite into your life to speak into those things. And the question I have for you today is as you're populating some of this, as you're already making assumptions and assertions about who your casual friends are, close friends, and your core friends are, let me ask you this. How do we choose who goes where? Maybe some of you, you're not even choosing at all. You just allow people to kind of slot themselves. But here's the thing. The Bible says you really shouldn't do that. The Bible says, in fact, one of the worst ways to ruin your, one of the easiest ways to ruin your life is to let people fill in those roles themselves. And one of the most popular, most prolific places the Bible says that is in an entire book of the Bible called Proverbs. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time in this series. Proverbs has this root, this, this um, repeating theme. And it goes like this. It's the same in Proverbs chapter 1, but in Proverbs 13, I think it's pretty, pretty clear. This is the writer of Proverbs. He says, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. The writer is saying, there are some key decisions you have to make in your life, beginning with who your core friends are and making wrong decisions when it comes to things like that, let alone what college you're going to go to, what, what major you're going to major in, who you're going to marry, let alone those questions there are some decisions that you can make and not make that can cause you great harm. And that's pretty simple logic, right? That's why we have this word called regret. Oh, I regret doing that. That's why we have this word, word called mistake. I made a mistake. You know, we know, I know. There are some decisions that you can make that are terrible for you, that hurt you and harm you. And there are some decisions you can make that are good for you. And so the question is, how do we decide who should be our core friends? let alone our close friends and our other friends? Well, Proverbs has a lot to say about that. First of all, it says in Proverbs 12, 26, 
The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The contrast here is the, why, the righteous, they with care and concern and intentionality choose, but the wicked, they let themselves be led. Do you hear that? You see that? Those who fall into wickedness, they let others just kind of control their thought. They let TikTok just indoctrinate them and just they go with the flow. But the righteous, they choose. They put stakes in the ground, draw lines in the sand. Proverbs goes on to say, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. I love that it says, okay, whoever walks with the wise, the influence, if you choose in your core friends, wise friends, they will make you wise. But I love how he says the companion of fools will cause you harm. You know, the word companion in the Hebrew is not the word friend. Companion, you could even say acquaintance or associate. I love that word because it's so true. The way Paul puts it in the New Testament, bad company corrupts good character. If you associate continually with the wicked, you're going to make wicked decisions. It's pretty simple, right? But if you carefully choose to walk with the wise, you become wise. You make better, healthier decisions for you and for those around you and for those you care about. Uh, when I was growing up and I heard this for the first time, I thought, man, this is, I don't know, man, that doesn't sound very Christian wholesome to me. Shouldn't as Christians, we love everybody. The, the reality is, yes, we should love everybody, but we shouldn't invite everybody into that core group of friends. This is Paul talking to Timothy. He says, hey, there's a guy named Alexander. He's a metal worker. He did me great, a great deal of harm. And the Lord will, will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. That's Paul. Even Paul is like, you got to be careful who you befriend. As Christians, yes, we should love all, but we don't give all access into our love is what he's saying. And if that sounds unjesusy to you, I love how one pastor summarizes his name is Rick Warren. He's the pastor of Salvation Church. He says it like this. Jesus loved everybody, undoubtedly. However, he fed only the 5,000. He trained only 120. He discipled only 12. And he mentored only three. Because Peter, James, and John, they were the only ones who were allowed to go into the Garden of Gethsemane with him. They were the only ones who went up to the mount to see him transfigure. And they were the only ones to see Peter's mother-in-law healed. He spent the maximum amount of time with those who would end up with the maximum amount of responsibility as those three, Peter, James, and John became in the book of Acts, what we see as the pillars of the church. They were the main, they were the lead deacons and lead elders, rather, I should say, who helped plant other churches more than others. So even Jesus chose his friendships. Yes, he had love for everybody, but he carefully chose who to allow into his core group of friends and who did not. He didn't just let people slide in there. He chose who should belong there. So let's get practical now. Ready? Who should we choose to enter into that core group of friends? Because you can't have many. Core group of friends require you to have the energy to pick up your phone at three in the morning and be like, all right, what do you need? Okay. Core group of friends. How do we choose who should go in there? Well, the Bible says, first of all, a bunch of things about who not to allow in there. And number one, Bible says, Proverbs says, people who are you. Proverbs 20, verse 3. It is to one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. You guys know anybody who's like constantly arguing? Well, actually, I read the United States. Hey, I, you know, I really like that. Would you know that that is like for this reason is stupid? Or, hey, you're dumb for liking these things and not those things. People who just argue, you know what I'm saying, okay? Bible's like, you, you shouldn't allow these, maybe you allow them into your acquaintances, but these people don't belong in your core group of friends because friends argue with each other, not against each other, okay? 
So I can be a Democrat and my friend can be a Republican and I don't discount him and cancel him because just because he's not the same political party as me, but we can argue together. I can say, here's my stance on abortion. What's yours? Okay. Well, we can argue with each other, but not against each other. I don't say at the end of the day, you dumb Republican or you uh, whack liberal. We don't come to those conclusions, but we argue with each other. That's what friends do. And so your core friends, likewise. Who also shouldn't be your core friends? Those who gossip. This is pretty much, you know, friendship one-on-one, right? Proverbs 20, verse 9. A gossip betrays a confidence. So avoid anyone who talks too much. I love that. This is tough to do in high school because gossip is like part of the intrinsic narrative of being a high schooler. But you got to be careful who you allow into your core group of friends because your friends who tend to gossip about others to you, guess what they're doing um, to, you know, guess what they're doing behind your back. They're doing the same thing, right? Saying the same thing about you. So what you want to do is make sure you, you save and savor your core friends for those people who are able to protect you behind your back, not degradate you behind your back and who celebrate you behind your back. Who else? Okay. A couple more people who like to flatter. You guys know what flatter means? Flattery means like just empty, empty compliments. Proverbs 29, five says, those who flatter their neighbor are spreading nets for their feet. I love that. I love that. It's like, essentially like uh, you're just going to fall into a trap, right? People who flatter are people who are constantly just, they don't know how to do anything else, but compliment you. I heard one comedian say it like this. He was in a coffee shop standing in a line you heard two girls over her two girls talking and one of the girls had recently been broken up with by a guy and this girl's immediate response to that without knowing any other detail about the guy or about why they broke up was immediately oh he's so stupid you're perfect that's flattery that's emptiness right that that doesn't mean because we're all imperfect we all have issues and traumas and junk we're working out and so as a good friend what i should be able to do is genuinely compliment you but i should also be be real with you if you make a mistake if you've uh, compromised your integrity in some way i should be able to speak into that and tell you hey you know you kind of deserved it to be broken up with because that was really bad of you to do that thing all right two more actually maybe one more who else shouldn't be part of that core group of friends those who can't control their temper oh this is so important so important do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Man, nowadays, this is so important, guys. God bless you. If there's somebody who gets so triggered and get blindsided with rage over one issue, those people don't belong in your core group of friends, okay? Because people who rage over an issue without knowing the other side of the issue or without knowing the people within that issue, they're using their rage for something. They're using something really sacred for something very unsacred and, and very, they're using something special, their anger for something really, really uh, not only unspecial, but maybe even like bad. You know what I mean? Core friends should reserve their anger for what is really righteous, not what's really selfish, right? You don't want to be in a friendship where the, you, know, you can't bring up this certain topic because it's going to trigger that person into a rage. Nowadays, it might be hard to do. And so that leads us to this issue. Well, where the heck do I find core friends then? <laughs> Uh, I don't know anybody who isn't any of these things. Uh, in fact, most people are more than one of these things. Who can I invite into that core group of friends? In some years after, oh, also people who use and steal. This one we're going to talk more about later, but anybody who uses you for personal gain, obviously, right? That's, which is everybody, to be honest. Where do we find a, a friend who's worthy to be a core friend? Some years after the book of Proverbs, Jesus would come to the stage and he would say this, the night he's betrayed, the night he is betrayed. So he's with his 12 disciples, one of whom literally will sell him out for some silver. 
and the other 11 who will deny him and abandon him as soon as they see the Roman guards come to arrest him. And here is what he says to them, knowing that that's going to happen in a few hours over dinner while he's breaking bread at the same table with these 12 people. This is what he says. I no longer, no longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you, Jesus, the perfect friend who would never, never rage on you, who would never lose his temper on you, who would never use you and manipulate you, uh, the perfect friend who would never gossip about you at the cost and expense of himself, befriends people, unfriendly, unfriendable people just like you. Because the reality is, you know, that list of people we shouldn't allow to be our core friends, as, as hard as it is to find friends that qualify, you don't qualify either. And yet, what has Christ done? But he came at the cost of himself to befriend you. So much so that as he hung on that cross for your sins, for your unfriendliness, what does he say to God? He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What a friend we have in Jesus, the ultimate friend. And therefore, let me just share three application points here. Therefore, if and when Jesus is my true best friend, the reality is this. No more, no longer can I ever feel a kind of loneliness that is produced from a lack of friendship because I have the ultimate friend. Never will I let my loneliness push me to the extent that I get so depressed and despondent and I feel so alone that I just want to end it all because Jesus, he ended it all on the cross at the cost of himself to befriend you. You know what the worst possible like nightmare for a friend is? You know that feeling of like as you let your certain people you know get to know you more and more? Every single one of us fears a certain line to be crossed, right? That if this person passes this line and knows the stuff back here, she or he will never be my friend ever again. But Jesus knows what's past that line and yet is still befriended you at the cost to himself. And therefore... I don't let crippling loneliness destroy my life because Christ was destroyed on the cross to befriend me, to give me new life. And out of the confidence I have in, my, in the friendship I have with Jesus, because Jesus is the best friend and the ultimate core friend, I now have a new standard for friendship. I have the confidence to be like, there are some friends that I should say yes to and some I shouldn't. For those of you who saw that list of like what Proverbs is saying, don't allow these people into your core group of friends. And some of you feel like you don't have the, the power to do that because making friends is hard. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's difficult to do that. And you don't feel secure enough to say no to some friends and yes to others. It's that insecurity is because you don't have a friend like Jesus. You, Jesus is still not your ultimate friend. But if I have an eternal friend, an ultimate friend in Christ, then that courage allows me, the strength of that friendship allows me to say yes to some and no to others. It, it increases my standard for friendship as it does increases my standard for dating. Does that make sense? If you're compromised, if you know somebody that's like dating someone that they really shouldn't be dating, that's like terrible for them, you as their friend, you're looking at them saying, I, you're only doing that because you're not confident in yourself because you don't like yourself. And the only way you'll like yourself is, is someone likes you, right? That's kind of, as a friend, external friend, you see that and it's easy to know that. And that's the same with us. That's the same with you, right? That if we're compromising on who our friends are, it's because we're not secure enough that Jesus is our ultimate friend. So if Jesus is my best friend, the ultimate friend, then I have the courage and confidence to, to be able to say yes to some friends and no to others. Not, not all, not Acquaintances, I mean your core friends. And then lastly, if Jesus is my ultimate friend, then I, I want to now become, through the confidence I have in that relationship, in that friendship with him, 
I want to become more friendly. Not friendlier in the way that the world defines friendship, because cl clearly the way the world defines friendship is hostile. It's temper temperamental. It's bipolar. If it's like up good one day, terrible the next. But genuine friendship with Christ, that constancy of eternal friendship with Jesus gives me the strength not only to have higher standards for friendship, but it also makes me a better friend. And that's why I would say, this is a small parenthetical point we'll pick up next week, but that's why it's difficult to make core friends outside of a community that believes in Jesus, that has Jesus. Because there is no place to find that eternal confidence of friendship outside of Jesus. But when you do, when we do together, not only can we experience, finally experience, maybe for the first time, true friendship, good friendship, not walk on eggshells, I can't talk about this, can't talk about that kind of friendship, but true friendship, not only can we experience that, but you, man, you can become a really good just like Jesus. And we'll pick up on that note next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray. Thank you. Thank you that Jesus, Jesus, thank you that you've befriended us, that you are our best friend. You are the best friend. As in, there is no friend that is better at being a friend than you are, Jesus. And that is epitomized on the cross where you fully knew us and yet you fully loved us. And at the expense and cost of yourself, you came down into our broken, unfriendly world, our unfriendly habits, our unfriendly mindset, and you befriended us and loved us. And so I pray, may that give us courage and confidence, power, Lord, and resilience to have a higher standard of friendship, to not just allow people to slip into, quote, friendships and, and into uh, places of influence in our life, but that we would seek wisdom and choose intentionally wise friends, especially as our core friends. And help us, Lord, in that, with that same courage and confidence to become friendlier, starting here, starting here. Let us be friendlier to one another here. Let us be friendlier to one another at home and let alone to the spaces and places outside of those places. Lord, we thank you. As we continue in this friendship, Lord, in this uh, series on friendship, Lord, we thank you and praise you, and we ask that you would grow us into good friends and to grow good friendships, Lord, in Jesus' name.